Hey guys, my name is Jacob and I'm so excited that you've chosen to join us online today. I believe that you're going to be encouraged today as a result. If this is your first time joining us, I'd like to give a special shout out to you. If you would, text the word FIRST to the number on the screen. We'd love to send a gift card for coffee on us. Thanks again for joining us today. Excited for what God has in store. Let's dive in. Hey, what's up? My name is Chris Ifill, lead pastor here at Grace River Church. I want to say thank you so much for watching online at home today. Uh, no matter where you're at on the spiritual journey, our hope is that you take a next step closer to meeting, knowing, and following Jesus through this teaching today. We are in a series called Jesus, and we're actually talking about the life of Jesus leading up uh, to, the, to the crucifixion of Christ and the resurrection. In fact, uh, this coming Sunday is Easter Sunday here at Grace River Church, and we actually have Easter weekend. We've added some additional services. We actually have six total Easter weekend services on Friday, April 7th at 6 p.m., Saturday, April 8th at 4.30 uh, 6 and 6 p.m., and then Sunday at 9, uh, su Sunday the 9th at 8.30, 9.45, and 11 o'clock. That's our uh, three normal Sunday service times. We've added three additional on Friday and Saturday, and so, man, I hope that you come in person. It's going to be a great service. Uh, my promise to you is that if you come at Easter in, at Grace River in person, you're going to have a good time. You're going to hear the truth about Jesus, and you're going to get a chance to respond to the gospel. It's going to be a great time. And so uh, I can't wait to meet you, bring friends and family. There's going to be fun for all ages. And uh, Easter is such a special time of year just to celebrate the hope that we have because of Jesus. And so my, my commitment is there's going to be a life-giving message. The music's going to be amazing. You will not want to miss it. It's going to be awesome. And so uh, come out to Easter at Grace River, and we are in the middle of really wrapping up a series on the life of Jesus and uh, we conclude that series on Easter Sunday here at Grace River and so Jesus uh, is a pretty important figure uh, you know and my, my goal and my hope as we've walked through this series we look at the gospel of Matthew and really been diving into who is Jesus to you personally like moving beyond just the academic Jesus moving beyond just what you may think about Jesus but like who is Jesus to you personally uh, was he just a miracle worker, just a prophet, just a good man, just a good teacher, or is he the one that came to redeem us? And uh, just that concept of redemption, I actually looked it up in the dictionary. And to redeem means simply this, to purchase it back or to rescue it. And that's really what Jesus came to do for us was to redeem us. And all throughout the Bible, uh, it's amazing, the Bible uh, is made up of 66 different books. Uh, so this is like one book. Uh, but it's made up of, of multiple books, 66 different books, and uh, written by over 40 different authors on three different continents over 1,600 years in three different languages. But what's interesting is, is that every single page of this book, whether it's the Old Testament or the New Testament, every single page of this book is pointing us to the person of Jesus. And today we're actually going to look at a picture that God is trying to paint for us in the Old Testament that helps us to understand our need uh, for him in the New Testament. And so, uh, like today, for example, we, we look at this and uh, we think today, often whenever we're teaching or we're talking about something, we would teach something or talk about something in points. But God uses pictures instead or metaphors or even foreshadowing. And he does that best, really, uh, with, with a story in the book of Exodus. And so, it's, it's weird that we would start there today as we we're, were kind of wrapping up the life of Jesus. Why would we start in Exodus? Well, we're actually going to receive communion together today, even uh, for those watching online today. So I encourage you uh, to find something in your house. Maybe you've got some grape juice or a cracker or something, because uh, we're going to receive communion at the end of this time together today. But uh, the Passover meal uh, is first actually found in the book of Exodus, and it's something uh, that, that Jewish believers have done for centuries. Uh, and it's really there as a representation and as a reminder of, uh, of, what, of what took place whenever the nation of Israel was freed from captivity uh, from Egypt. And so in the book of Exodus, we see these instructions. And I want you to think for a second just how weird this would be today for us uh, in our modern situation, just how difficult uh, and how a little bit awkward this would be. But you, if you don't know the story, the quick Cliff Notes version of this is that uh, the nation of Israel was enslaved. They were in bondage. Uh, to, the, to the Egyptians. And so uh, the Egyptians ruled most of the earth during this time period in the, in the known world. And so uh, they, they, they had captivity. They had the nation of Israel in captivity. They were building buildings and monuments for them. Uh, and it was, they were totally under oppression, the Israelites were. And God wanted to free them. And God used uh, a leader in their life named Moses 
uh, to, to lead them. And God, God instructed them to be set free uh, from Pharaoh, the, the uh, Egyptian leader. And then God sent some plagues to make it difficult for the Egyptians. Uh, and, and there was this tension back and forth, back and forth between the Egyptians, God, and these Israelite people. But then we see in Exodus chapter 12, uh, the importance of this Passover meal. In Exodus chapter 12, starting in verse 3, uh, this is the instructions that God gave Moses to give to the people. He says, announce to the whole community of Israel that on the 10th day of this month, each family, this is really important because later we're going to see this is actually foreshadowing. On the 10th day of this month, each family must choose a lamb or a young goat for sacrifice, one animal for each household. And so each family uh, of the nation of Israel would select a spotless, a perfect a perfect lamb, um, and one for each household. So a family would find a lamb and bring it home. You can imagine a young, this young family circled around. There's this little cute spotless lamb, right? It's, it's doing the things that lambs do. Maybe they name it. I don't know. Uh, but obviously they're not going to get too, too attached to it because they're going to sacrifice this. So if a family's too small to eat the whole animal, let them share with another family in the neighborhood. Divide the animal accordingly to the size of each family and how much they, they can eat. The animal you select must be one, a one-year-old male either a sheep or a goat with no defects. So you can't, you can't pick out a scrub. You can't pick out a bad one. It needs to be, it needs to be a good, healthy lamb uh, or goat here. And then uh, in verse 6, take special care of this chosen animal until the evening of the 14th day. So the animal is going to live with them for four days. So on the 10th day of the month, right? So, so this is, for me, I would gain a little bit of attachment for this, especially if they had young kids. You could see the problem here. Uh, on the 14th day of the first of the month, the whole assembly of the community of Israel must slaughter their lamb or young goat at twilight. They're to take some of the blood and smear it on the sides of the top of their door frame, frames of the house where, where they eat the animal. This is pretty wild. Uh, on the night I will pass through the land of Egypt and strike down every firstborn son, every firstborn male animal in the land of Egypt, I will execute judgment against all of, God, all of the gods of Egypt for I am. I am the Lord. And so uh, in, in the Old Testament, man, they experienced a lot of God's wrath. And this is one of those moments where uh, unless they would have had this blood painted over the doorpost. So you may wonder, why is this entitled Passover? Well, the, the point of Passover was that uh, God was going to pass over these door frames uh, that were painted in blood. Uh, and those families would be rescued. Those families would be redeemed. Uh, by the by, the blood of this particular animal, right? Then in, in verse, in verse uh, thirteen, but the blood on your dope doorpost will serve as a sign marking the houses where you are staying. When I see the blood, I will pass over you. This plague of death will not touch you when I strike down the land of Egypt. And then in verse fourteen, this is a day uh, to remember each year from generation to generation. You must celebrate it as a special festival of the Lord. And so for thousands of years afterwards, man, uh, there are still people that celebrate Passover as a result of that. And uh, I've even been to a Passover meal myself, a Seder meal, they call it. And, uh, you know, there, there are certain elements at a Seder meal that kind of very similar to the elements that we celebrate whenever we do communion. Uh, the only difference is, is there, there, there's a cup uh, and there is unleavened bread at a Seder meal, but there's also, there's also lamb or goat at a Seder meal. But ultimately what God is doing here in the Old Testament is God is painting a picture of what's to come. So essentially, the whole point of Passover is to help us to, to get used to the idea that we would need some kind of sacrifice to rescue and redeem us. And it's amazing is, is God's actually foreshadowing this in the Old Testament. Uh, and that's why I said it earlier, every single page of this book is pointing us to the person of Jesus. And so now we've been in this series called Jesus, and we've been looking at Matthew's gospel. And I want to take a look at the last week of the life of Jesus. And it's interesting because there's a, a really big parallel to the Passover meal that they're celebrating here in Exodus. We can actually fast forward 1,600 years later uh, to the last week of the life of Jesus. And so Matthew 21 is where we're going to pick this story up. But Matthew 21 verse 8 says, Most of the crowd, Jesus enters into Jerusalem. And interestingly enough, there's multiple city gates that he could have entered in into the city of Jerusalem. But it's wild because he actually picks the gate known as the Sheep Gate. And remember earlier in Exodus, we looked at the story um, and it was this idea of, 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 of a sheep, right, being sacrificed. It was the blood of a, of a lamb, the blood of a sheep that would be sacrificed uh, so that it would save 
uh, the nation of Israel or save the firstborn from the nation of Israel, right? Uh, most of the crowd spread their garments on the road ahead of them, and others cut branches from the trees and spread them out on the road. This is known as Palm Sunday, right? And uh, today, Christians, uh, this weekend, Christians celebrate what is known as Palm Sunday. It's the, the last week or the beginning of the last week of Christ. And so when he enters into Jerusalem, it would have been a Sunday, uh, and this is what they did. They, he enters into the sheep gate, they cut branches off of palm trees, they lay coats down just for the donkey to walk on that he's riding into town with, which by the way, even that particular detail of him riding in on a donkey was prophesied in the book of Isaiah 400 years prior to this event actually happening. And so uh, then in verse 9 here, Jesus was in the center of the procession. So you can imagine like a big parade. It's like he's at Disney or something, right? This is a big moment. And the people all around him were shouting, praise God for the son of David. Blessings on the one who comes in the name of the Lord. Praise God in highest heaven. Now, the reason why they're so excited to see Jesus is they're convinced uh, that he is going to be the one that will set them free from Roman oppression. Again, here's the same, the same uh, race of people, uh, these Jewish people, these, these Israelite believers. And they, what they are is they, they're no longer under Egyptian oppression like they were in the Old Testament in the book of Exodus. But now they're under Roman oppression. And they think that Jesus is the one that's going to set them free politically. They think that Jesus is the one that's going to actually set them free uh, from, from the Roman government. And he's actually coming not to do that, but to set them free and to set us free from our sins. So Jesus is coming to solve a much bigger problem than, than uh, a Roman-occupied situation. And then in verse 10, the entire city of Jerusalem was in an uproar as he entered. Who is this, they asked. And the crowds replied this, it's Jesus the prophet from Nazareth in Galilee. So there's some things that, that God's doing, and really uh, Jesus is actually painting a great picture here, and, it, and it's this picture. Is, is, he's entering in through the sheep gate, which is an interesting illustration that he uses here. And so he's entering in this sheep gate, which is, I mentioned before, there are multiple city gates that he could have entered into. He enters into the gate that was reserved for sheep to come through during Passover week. And so each family would select, it was like you'd go to a market and select uh, your sheep. And that, that's the other reason this is so significant is not only does he go through the gate that was, speci that was speci specified for sheep, he also goes through the gate on a specific day that's known as selection day. It's like, it's like free agency, it's like draft day. This is a really important day for the nation of Israel because this is the day that they would pick out the sheep that they would use for their family. And what essentially what is being foreshadowed here is this, is Jesus is saying, I want you to choose me. Like I am the lamb. I am the sheep. I am the perfect sacrifice. Uh, and, but then there's also this, this imagery of unleavened bread that also happens, uh, which is a picture that God is giving us here too. And he's basically saying, I am, I'm the bread of life. And in Isaiah chapter 53, it like I mentioned, the book of Isaiah was written 400 years before all this happened. Here's what the book of Isaiah says about, about what Jesus was going to come and do for us. That, that he would be pierced for our rebellion, crushed for our sins. He was beaten so we could be made whole. He was whipped so we could be healed. Like it, it's all coming to pass saying that this, that he is the one that would come and set us free. And we look at unleavened bread and man, it, it, it's pierced. In fact, one of the ways that this bread is made, is made quickly. It's, it's made without yeast. Uh, because yeast represents sin, uh, and so it's it's made it's it's known as unleavened bread. So if you ever uh, if you've ever received communion and wonder why does this bread not have taste, or why does it feel like like it's just nothing, and the reason why it feels like that is because it's intended to not have yeast in it, to not have flavor in it, um, because yeast represents it represents sin. And so uh, we go on to read here in verse six. All of us like sheep have stayed have strayed away. We have left God's path to follow our own, yet the Lord laid on him the sins, the sins of us all. And so he's laying the groundwork here saying this, is that I'm the one that's come to set you free from your sins. And then in Matthew 26, here's what the Bible says here. As they were eating, Jesus took some bread. So we're going to fast forward now from the day he enters into four days later. So after he enters into Jerusalem, four days later, he's celebrating the Passover meal with his disciples. And there's something missing 
at that Passover meal, something uniquely different than every other Passover meal they'd ever celebrated in their entire lives. And he goes off script a little bit. Like there were, there were certain things that you would say in certain moments of a Passover meal. And he, he actually goes off script here. And here's what he does here in, in Matthew 26, verse 26. As they were eating, Jesus took some bread and blessed it. And then he broke it into pieces and gave it to the disciples saying this, take this, this is, take this and eat it for this is my body. And this is where he goes off script because typically they would have taken the bread and said, take this bread the bread, they would, they would be called the bread of affliction. And they would say, this is, this, is what, uh, this is what is to come. And essentially what he's saying is, is he's saying, no, I, I am the bread. That this actually represents my, what will be my broken body on the cross for you. And so it's a pretty dramatic moment. And it would have been one of those things where the disciples would have definitely taken note going, wow, this is definitely different than, than a normal Passover meal. Uh, this is what's known as the Last Supper, the last time they would all gather together uh, for Passover together. Then in verse 27, and then he took the cup of wine and he gave thanks to God for it. And he gave it to them and he said this, each of you, each of you drink, drink from it. And essentially Jesus is actually painting a picture with the cup here as well. And so another, another metaphor that he's trying to use is, is the, known as what's known as the four cups. And so you know, again, metaphors that he used was the sheep gate, selection day the unleavened bread, but he also uses the metaphor of the cup and really four cups. And so uh, the cup really represents four different things, right? And so uh, there is the cup of, there's the cup of sanctification. So it's this cup that, that, uh, that, that helps us to understand that like, man, we are, we are delivered. Um, and then there's also the cup of deliverance. So this is also, this is known as the cup that's going to be the one that's going to set us free. And so they were, they were delivered uh, from the nation of Israel. And so there's the cup of deliverance and there's also the cup of redemption. So the cup that says, okay, we are, we are redeemed. Uh, We were bought back by the blood of Jesus. And so uh, the cup of sanctification, they were going to be sanctified, they got sanctified out of the, of the nation of Egypt, uh, that they were delivered from, from Egyptian oppression uh, and that they were redeemed. But again, Jesus going off script here a little bit from a normal Passover meal says this in verse 28 of Matthew chapter 26. For this is my blood, which confirms the covenant between God and his people. It is poured out as a sacrifice to forgive the sins of many. And this is significant here because it's also, this is like I mentioned before, it's the, the cup of redemption, but it's also the cup of restoration, uh, which is the, the fourth cup here. And at the, at the end of this passage here in Matthew 26, verse 29, it says this, Mark my words, I will not drink wine again until the, this is Jesus talking, Mark my words, I will not drink wine again until the day I drink it in with you in my Father's kingdom. And so he's actually reserving that fourth cup uh, for heaven, that when we go there, we'll drink this cup with him. It's pretty significant to think about, to think, man, there's, there's a cup waiting for me in heaven that I'll drink with Jesus if I'm one of his followers. That's pretty, pretty awesome to think about. So I always like to close a sermon with what we call next steps. Uh, and essentially today, man, you really have two next steps to think about and consider today. The first next step is, will you just decide I'm going to choose him? Like that's, that's, that's what we want you to do is like, will you choose Jesus? The significance of this story of, of Palm Sunday, of him entering into the sheep gate, of him entering in on selection day is that Jesus metaphorically is just saying this, God's painting a picture and God's saying this, will you choose me? Like there's a lot of different things that you could choose in your life. You could choose money, you could choose power, you could choose, you know, you could choose popularity, you could choose a career, you could choose a family. Like these are all, these are not awful things, right? But ultimately, at the end of the day, we have to make a decision about who, it is go- who is going to be the savior of my life. And it boils down to two different people. It's either me, I'm going to save myself with my own good works, my own abilities, or I'm going to trust in him. And I'm going to say, he is, he is my savior. The point of Matthew's gospel is if, if God has a kingdom, there has to be a king. So who is the king? And I want you to know today, it's either Jesus or it's you. And I wonder today if you would go, you know what, man, I've been choosing me for so long. I'm ready to choose him to be my savior, to be my Lord, to be the king of my life. And secondly, the next step is if you're a believer, would you prepare your heart to commune with him? And that's just simply this. Would you prepare your heart to meet with him? To say, man, God, you, 
like to make sure that, that, that everything in your life is whole. There's nothing hidden from him, that like your, your heart is right with him, that your heart is right with other believers, uh, that there's no, there's no tension between you and somebody else. And if there is, that you'd make that right before you re- would receive communion, that all is well in your soul. Like, is that true of you today? Like, is there any kind of relationship in your life that needs to be mended or fixed, whether it's a relationship, the relationship with God or maybe it's a relationship with somebody uh, in your past or even in your present that things are not right with? I want to encourage you before you receive communion, it's a great idea to, to investigate your own heart, to consider, man, what is it that I need to fix in my life? Like, what, what areas do I need to sure up? Maybe an old hurt, an old habit, an old hang up. I just want to... I want to encourage you to even just take a moment. In fact, I'm going to ask you to bow your heads and close your eyes right now before we receive communion together. And I just want you to take a moment to think about just the grace and the goodness of God and consider, man, is there anything in my life that I need to fix? Is there anything in my life that I need to repent of and tell God I'm sorry about? Is there a relationship that I need to, that I, that, that I need to seek forgiveness or restoration in? Well, in fact, I want to give you a moment just right now in the stillness just to pray by yourself and to talk to God about this. Or maybe you're here today and you've never, you've never said yes to making Jesus the Lord of your life. Like when you think about next steps, you've never said, God, I choose you. In a moment, I'm going to pray with you and give you the chance to say yes to making him the savior of your life. And maybe the day where you say, this is my selection day where I'm choosing him. I'm going to give you a second to pray and then I'm going to pray for you. God, we thank you for the picture that you're painting, that you've painted and that you're painting in our lives. The picture from the Old Testament of our desperate need for you, our need for redemption. And God, the picture that you painted even with the disciples. God, I I thank you that in in the Last Supper, the one element that was missing was lamb. It wasn't on the table because the lamb was seated at the table. The lamb was Jesus. So God, today I pray for the person that's never chose you. And God, I pray that in this moment, they would recognize their need for you and say yes to making you the Lord of their life. They would simply say, you are my savior. You are my Lord. If that's you today and you've never prayed that, you've never declared that, you can pray a prayer just like this. God, thank you for sending your only son to come and die in my place. And God, today I accept that I needed a savior. I needed redemption. I could have never redeemed myself, but you sent him in my place. And God, I believe with my whole heart, God, that it was his life in exchange for mine, that he is the perfect lamb, the perfect sacrifice. And God, today I confess with my heart and my life, you and only you to be the Lord of my life. Help me to live every day of my life for you and not for me. Thank you for saving me and making me a Christian. It's in Jesus' name that we pray all this. Amen. Man, if you just prayed that prayer, I just want to encourage you and uh, I want to cheer you on, man, on your journey. In fact, if you could just simply text the word yes to the phone number on the screen, we'd love to celebrate with you. That's just the word yes to 636-336-2475. That's the word yes to 636-336-2475. Well, I want to receive communion together with you right now. And uh, so maybe you've got something laying around the house that you can use, some grape juice or a cracker. And, uh, you know, when we think about communion, I think it's important to be reminded what scripture has to say about it uh, and to to circle back to this was uh, the cracker represents the broken body uh, of Jesus. It was his body uh, that was pierced on the cross uh, for our sins. And so let's receive uh, the cracker today as a representation of the broken body of Jesus Christ. Let's receive this together. think about the cup. The cup is his shed blood uh, for us. Uh, It was uh, what purchased our salvation. Just like uh, the nation of Israel experienced in the book of Exodus with the Passover, uh, with the Passover lamb. And they took the blood and they smeared it on the doorposts uh, as a representation of of a sacrifice. And today uh, we don't have to do that. And the reason why we don't have to do that is because Jesus came and shed his blood and he was the one-time sacrifice for our sins. 
And so today, as we take the cup together, we're reminded of, of this sacrifice of the blood of Jesus. So let's receive the cup. Well, I just want you to be, to be reminded and to understand that there was nothing special about the elements that you just took. They were simply representation of what it is that Christ did for you on the cross for our sins. And every single Sunday at Grace River, we celebrate a, a risen Savior. We celebrate the resurrection. The good news about Jesus is this, is that he didn't stay dead. And that's why I want to really invite you out to Easter at Grace River Church, because uh, at Easter, we celebrate the entire story and what it means uh, that Jesus didn't stay dead is that no matter what you're up against, no matter what your difficulty is, no matter what dead end there may be in your life, I want you to know there's hope because of the risen Savior, Jesus Christ. And so I cannot wait to meet you in person right here at Grace River Church, uh, Easter weekend at Grace River. Thanks and have a great day. I hope that you were encouraged by what you heard today. Here at Grace River, we believe that it's important to give back to the God who has given us everything. If you feel inclined to give, I'd like to give you that opportunity now. You can do so by texting Grace River to the number on the screen. And lastly, I'd like to personally invite you to one of our three in-person services every single Sunday at 8.30, 9.45, and 11 a.m. That's it for today. We hope to see you soon.